you gonna make this as a movie? Are you, Dad? Yeah. I'm gonna make a movie. Yeah, I'm gonna make a movie. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, really cool. It was because of my first trip to Africa that I came to realize my spirit had been aware of rejection from the very beginning, inside my mother's womb. I'd gone to South Africa during apartheid's last years to observe and volunteer with interracial bridge-building youth camps, stayed in black townships, as well as white suburbs, and did what I could to help out people living on the streets. I also joined an arts outreach group where I was cast in a dance drama to a song about abortion, a subject I'd never thought about before. At the start of the dance, there was a choreographed scooping out motion of the womb. But each time I tried to do it, I practically blacked out. When I went home to Canada, I told my mother about the dance trauma blackouts. That's when she told me the story of my conception. She could see an emotional and spiritual connection between the blackouts and the rejection my spirit had felt from my very beginning inside her womb. My parents met as co-workers on a passenger freighter sailing between Canada and my mother's home country, Guyana, in the Caribbean. My dad once wrote that he'd sworn off women until my mother boarded the ship, and then he knew he was in trouble. My mother said it was on an alcohol-fueled summer's night in Montreal during Expo 67 that one thing led to another, and she became an unexpected, expecting mother. The moment a person conceives or anything like that, that's a, that's a beginning of a new spirit. A spirit has been born. A spirit has been brought into this world. The spirit will find another way into the to the world. And if the mother is not prepared to bring it in to the world at that time, then it will happen in its own time. Personally, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in a soul or spirit. But everyone certainly has the right to believe that if they want. But if you look at it, actually, the facts is like as soon as one zygote, or as soon as it becomes a zygote, like the sperm and the egg meme, completely different DNA so that's how I classify an individual and a living being. How can you believe that a tiny fertilized egg the size of a period at the end of a sentence is equal to a full human being? Um, it doesn't make any logical sense and I don't think it's something that's even possible to really believe sincerely. When I asked the doctor what was developed he put a dot on the page and he says oh it's just a clump of tissue it's nothing and he lied to me. I don't believe in the soul, which, which is separate from the body. I don't believe in, in God. I don't believe in an afterlife. We know that all the genetic material that is uh, inside a human being is decided at that moment, at conception. And, and all it needs at that point is to be implanted and uh, given nutrition and protection, and it will develop into a human being. Do you realize that you were at one time that very, very tiny zygote in your mother's womb? Was that or was that not you? My mom told me that my dad gave her morning after type pills that a relative said would take care of it. When she returned home to Guyana, she found she was in fact pregnant. After she told me about the pills, it made sense of the deep-rooted fear of rejection I'd felt my whole life. When I asked my dad about the pills, he said we didn't know it was you. We didn't know you were anything more than a fly to be flicked off a wall. They didn't tell us. I probably wouldn't be here today if my mother had taken the pills that you can buy these days. I think that there is the potential for human life at the time of fertilization. Um, I think that pregnancy, uh, which is a relationship that exists between a woman and uh, a developing fetus, is something that cannot exist until implantation has occurred. People use the um implantation uh, point as their thesis as to when life begins so they can justify so-called emergency contraception uh, where drugs are given uh, after unprotected sex with the idea that if we now destroy the lining of the womb where the baby's going to implant, the baby can't implant there and human life has not been created, therefore an abortion has not been done. There's no doubt that uh, life of a new individual begins at conception. From science, it's very clear that human life begins at conception. We've seen egg and sperm joined under the microscope. We can watch the process of fertilization of an egg. And that brings about a certain 
development where the one cell then divides into two and then four and eight. When everything goes well, it's like a plant development of a new organism. Then within a matter of weeks of implantation, this baby has a heartbeat, it has brain waves, uh, it has hormones that are beginning to be produced. Uh, on ultrasound, we can see all these stages of development um, that are taking place, and there's nothing new that's being added all this time. It's all coming from within this, this fertilized egg, this baby that is developing inside the womb. And they, they follow a kind of directive, internal directive, which if we followed just as the program what had been set would eventually result in the birth of a baby nine months later. As it turned out, my mother wrote to my dad, who invited her to leave Guyana and come to Canada. They married in Vancouver, where I was born. At first, I didn't connect my conception story to the issue of abortion. My dream was to become a performing artist and raise awareness and help for the hungry and homeless in Africa. Instead, I became an artist, blindsided by an issue used to divide and conquer, invited to observe a gal I knew blocking clinic doors, quote, to give people a chance to rethink their choice, unquote. I'm on neither side, but somehow aware that pro-life equals anti-choice and rejection in the media-made public eye. Not from a Christian home, on a spiritual journey of my own, watching Jen seemingly at peace getting hauled off to jail, giving up her freedom for people she doesn't know. It moves me. Getting involved in actually doing civil disobedience around the pro-life issue, I guess it started from that moment when I met Lane and Kathy and moved into a community house with them. They had been involved in rescues previously back in 1989 when Every Woman's first opened. And that whole concept became a possible reality for me. One of the things that frustrated me, and I hate to say again, a criticism of the pro-life movement is that, you know, you expect a woman to go nine months inconvenience. I've seen my wife go through five pregnancies and pregnancy can be a tremendous difficulty. Especially when you think if it's unwanted and, you know, and yet most of those people wouldn't even do three months in jail. I think that to me came as just a stark hypocrisy. It became obvious to me that that was an action that I needed to take. My first experience, I was obviously, I was young. I guess I would have been like 21 years old. So. But I remember also just having a real sense of peace again, because I knew what I was doing was right and it was the most that I could do to, to, to love God and love my neighbor. It moves me moves me to ask, I don't want to go to jail, God, but what can I do? The question seeds roses within that bud and bloom in my mind through to my birthday when I rise with the sun to wait on a cold sidewalk, holding blossoms warm in my heart and hand for every woman who walks by and into the concrete gray windowless clinic. Flowers are later painted there. Someone paints over them black and stencils, where have all the flowers gone? Seen as anti-choice attack, have a rose. Today's my birthday. Our eyes meet in your double take. Have a rose. Today's my birthday. Our eyes meet in your double take. Unexpected compassion and grace flows. Will you accept this gift? Flash back to that first fateful day. A clinic staffer spins away from her circle of solidarity, aims at me and shoots off a photograph as if documenting someone dangerous. Spontaneous, intuitive, I think out loud. When you look at that picture, Remember, I survived an abortion attempt. The careless laughter from that broken circle is an ice-cold slap in the face of my existence, making it clear these people aren't on my side. Hands up for choice! Pain fills the interpersonal man-made political divide, and somehow I hope to bring some healing through this art from my heart to yours. Have a rose. Went as an observer, believe it or not Not pro this, not anti that, neither sold nor bought Just saw hurting people and the disease we've all got Faith the rhetoric, nix the politic, let love hit the spot I have a dream I have a dream that will come true When you learn from me and I learn from you Open, say uh-huh, uh-huh your mind open, say uh huh, uh huh. Your eyes open, say uh huh, uh huh. Your heart play, play. Your 
apart. The choice of abortion was made legal in Canada in 1969, the year after I was born. We decided to have an on to Ottawa abortion caravan that would start in Vancouver and go all the way across to Ottawa, gathering women with us as we went. We were very aware, even back then, that media often creates an issue and definitely shapes an issue. So um, we, when we started off, we gathered on the steps of the Vancouver Art Gallery. We wrote slogans on the, uh, on the vehicles, and we had banners, and we had t-shirts, and, and everywhere we stopped, we always had a press conference. 12,000 women! 12,000 women! There were not 12,000 deaths. That never stopped them. I mean, the big lie was like so many communist campaigns, the big lie is the thing. And so you say 12,000 women are dying from abortion, and if you say it often enough, I guess people believe it. Why are we going to sentence women back to coat hangers and bleach douches where they could die or be seriously injured? You know, when they start mentioning coat hangers, like to me that's so absurd because you're not going to find 300 women a day shoving coat hangers up their vagina. Which of course was nonsense. I think the numbers at the time in Canada, at the most you had somewhere between three and six women a year who actually died because they had abortions. And some of those abortions were performed by well-trained doctors. Forty years after abortion was legalized, the claim still persists. Thousands of women were dying each year from illegal abortion procedures. However, former abortionist Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who helped legitimize those numbers, admitted they were completely fabricated. No, 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 no. Quoting from his book, Aborting America, Nathanson says the overriding concern was to get the laws eliminated, and anything within reason that had to be done was permissible. Now, for example, it was now that um, didn't always support abortion. They were women's right um, group, but abortion wasn't on their top list. And Bernard Nathanson came to them, and and he lied to them. And it is amazing to me that they were so gullible that they t listened to him hook, line, and sinker. Now he is pro-life, and he's saying, "I lied to you. I told you wrong information because I wanted you to support my agenda." And instead of being furious with him, they're dismissing him. And I'm thinking, you ding-dongs, you know, you, you listen to him in the first place. And now that he, he admitted that he lied, you should be slamming him and saying, you, you lied to us, you, in essence, hurt women because of your lies. But they don't. They keep following with his rhetoric. And that bothers me because they're still touting the numbers he gave. You know, and saying that women, all these women were having abortions, that wasn't. And people are so misinformed, and they've not learned the truth. They've, a lot of people don't know that the man has lied. They were tricked into believing that somehow or other, killing their children was a privilege which was being denied to them, and that they could only uh, be considered equal and be respected if they were prepared to kill their own children. And to give you a little idea of the mindset of the feminist movement at the time uh, in the uh, early 70s and then further, there was an Equal Rights Amendment uh, which strictly stated that women had the right to the same pay for the same type of job uh, that we perform. We were trying to come up with something that would really empower women and give women a sense of their own strength and, and that it's not something we should um, have to ask for or beg for. It should be our right. We were convinced beyond any doubt that we were going to win the Equal Rights Amendment. And then when the Equal Rights Amendment failed, it came as an absolute blow to all of the women who had been fighting for so long. We decided we had to fight for something that men could not take away from us. 
and the most logical direction was reproductive rights. Free abortion on demand was a statement that a woman should be able to say, I want abortion. It's her body that's carrying the child. She should be the one to be able to say, I want this. It shouldn't be something that had to have the doctor's consent or a panel of doctor's consent or even the partner's consent. I started getting women coming to my office and asking for abortions and at first I would say, well, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I, I agree with you, you should have a right to that, but I, the law in Canada is still such that if I help you, I might go to jail and for long years. It was uh, life imprisonment at the time. I have a wife and have two children, so I can't help you, I'm sorry. And that after two months or so, I started thinking, well, that I'm a coward really. Why should I follow a law which is so cruel and unjust? Um, I have to take a stand. And I, then eventually my decision came clear that I was going to help these women. And uh, because of that, uh, I decided to do it with the best available method at the time, which was the vacuum suction technique, which I pioneered in North America. I was the first one to use it. I got the equipment from England, and then I started on my criminal career, if you like. I cried the whole way through. Then I saw Dr. Morgenthaler go over to a side area where there was a counter and a bunch of cabinets, and he was examining. the contents of the abortion and told me that I had been probably about seven weeks along. Bernard Nathanson changed his views in the mid-70s after performing an abortion guided by an ultrasound machine. Now for the first time, we have the technology to see abortion from the victim's vantage point. Those technologies, those apparatuses and machines which we now use every day have convinced us that beyond question the unborn child is simply another human being another member of the human community indistinguishable in every way from any of us I handled the ultrasound while the doctor performed the procedure and I directed him while I was watching the screen I saw the baby pull away. I saw the baby open his mouth. I had seen Silent scream a number of times, but it didn't affect me. To me, it was just more pro-life propaganda. But I couldn't deny what I saw on the screen. You were deceived thinking this is about women's rights. I had no idea it was about murder. Yeah. This is murder. It's not even abortion. Like yeah. somebody spoke last night. Yeah. It's murder. Yeah. We are killing God's creation. Yeah. And we are repenting of the deception that covers women to think it's about women's choices. We don't have choices. The choice we have is to choose life. It is vision which has caused us to do the action we are launching today of the new abortion caravan. It is a vision for an abortion-free Canada. It is a vision so that the only images we need ever see are images of formed pre-born children growing in the safety of their mother's wombs and not images of butchered children. The vision that we have is a vision where Canadians live up to our charter of rights and freedoms, which says everyone has the right to life. The Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform is marking the launch of what they're calling the abortion caravan. It's a play off the original 1970s movement um, by the women's movement. It's a trek that goes across Canada. It was originally taken back in the 70s and was part of one of the big pushes that I believe really legalized abortion in Canada. They are co-opting it and 
making it a, a movement for life, um, going along the way and educating uh, about pro-life facts as they go. And so in response to that launching, there's been a real resurgence of pro-choice activism in the city uh, coming out to counter-demonstrate, as you can see. I saw them driving down the road and it freaked me out and I saw other people having really emotional, frightening reactions to it. You saw what their reaction was? They're going to make their own decision, right? Because of the way this Some is displayed. Some people can't though. Some people, the fact that this exists, it's too triggering to even be able to I, I be in this space. So I'm doing that as an ally to folks that are triggered by this. How dare you hold those <laughs> pictures up? You are making me sick by this. And all of you pro life. What do you know about? It? What do you know? You're grinding my nose in this day after day. Just shut up. Get rid of your signs. Maybe I can feel okay. You keep grinding my nose. God! We're just grinding their noses day after day, keeping politicized. It hurts. Do that. You can't. Pictures of poor dying you are, fetuses and you think are, you're making a political statement. I'm you have no idea what it takes for people to make these decisions. This is life and it's not that simple. I go every broad, on Broadway and commercial every Friday. You can come and see me. People spit on me. Part of the reason people, that people get swear angry at me is because you are contributing to a culture of stigmatization of, of women. women. Yeah. What does that mean? You are stigmatizing in, in concrete women terms. In concrete terms. You are stigmatizing women who have had abortions or will have abortions in the future and contributing to a culture which makes it impossible for women to talk about their positive experiences or their negative experiences. People get upset because we don't want to see laws restricting our bodies. It's a very highly, highly emotional issue. Women's rights are under attack. What do we do? Stand up, fight back! I have never yelled at anybody, and most of us never have. We have never. I've had people spit at me. I've had people swear at me. But you say pro-choice. Where is my choice to disagree? Why do you guys have to be so angry? Why do you have to yell and swear at us because we don't agree? I know it's hurting for people who've had it. But if we really believe in something, just like you believe, why can't we talk like this? Dialogue cannot happen when you have one side that is calling us genocidal maniacs, which is what those tracks that have pictures of historical genocides on them are saying. You are shaming women who have had abortions and telling them that they are committing the equivalent of genocide. Can you not see what is wrong with them? So we're procuring images of violence which then elicit reaction, which is what they want. The problem is the reaction is very culturally associated with more violence. And I think that's the problem with GAP. Society is violent. And the problem with reaction is, if not carefully, pastorally dealt with, you're really feeding into the culture of violence that you're speaking to. How many uh, anti-choice people have killed doctors? Those are not pro-life people. If you ask any pro-life person who's a pro-life person, do they agree, agree with the killing of anybody? They're not pro-life. Yes, they are, Dr. Tiller. Dr. Tiller was shot in the lobby of his church on Sunday morning at close range in the head. That was because it was well known in the anti-abortion community that Dr. Tiller wore a bulletproof vest everywhere that he went. And the accused killer, named Scott Roeder, knew that too. Roeder is from Kansas City, a few hours drive from Wichita, and he has a long history on the fringe of the anti-choice movement. He associated regularly with members and leaders of Operation Rescue, a group that moved to Wichita in 2002 for the sole purpose of driving Dr. Tiller out of business. She's already having a hard enough time with this and I don't need your We're here to, again, attach that stigma of what it means to be an abortionist or to be involved in the abortion industry. And I think it's communicated extremely effectively in the graphic images because you just can't hide the truth. You just can't hide the fact that it's a dismembered little child in the womb. In 2005, four years before George Tiller was murdered, I visited Wichita with Gaetan and our two children. The doctor didn't have time for an interview, but neighbors around his clinic were willing to talk. We've seen close to 6,000 women since, since we opened. Uh, approximately a, a third of them have been pregnant and considering abortion. We have the abortion tools that we can even show them if they're interested in, in seeing the abortion tools and learning about the procedure. 
We've had a lot of girls upon seeing the abortion instruments said things like, you mean they put that thing inside of me? And they're, they're not uh, even familiar with what it is they're contemplating. Just wondering on what neighbors think of the setup on their street. <laughs> you got all day? Ha <laughs> Well, if, uh, if you got some time. Actually, I'm afraid I really don't. Hi there. How are you? Hi. Hi. I'm a journalist from Canada. I was just talking to your neighbor across the street. Uh-huh. You tried that lady across the street right there in, in the White House? No, no. She'll give you she'll give you everything you want to know and more. Did he tell you I'm from Canada? No, he didn't. I'm from Newfoundland. Oh wow. You see the Canadian flag flying on my van right there? Okay, I did. Well on the open the front you got a Canadian flag. Okay. What part of Canada are you from? I'm I'm from Vancouver, but I, I live in Quebec now. My son, my oldest son is forty one, he's living in Montreal. I just moved it back there from Tokyo. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. we all just got back from spending Christmas down in, uh, yeah, you can come, uh, yes, I got a lot to say about that, um, let me see, but not today, okay. I'm, I got to head to the base out here. Okay. So, you want to come back tomorrow? Okay, what would be a good time for you? Oh, I'd say about 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Have you ever seen the like of this? They, um, these are posters they make up of uh, employees that work over there. We have 310 of these and a whole stack of these here. Shelly Sella is a baby killer. Abortionist is the nice word. They post all of this stuff, okay, on telephone poles all the way oh, around. Wow. This comes in the mail, okay? And is that good enough? Yeah. The same thing with this one comes in the mail. We're not hurting anybody. We're not destroying property. We're not stealing. We're not defacing anybody's property. What we're doing is simply showing the truth. That's all. Showing and telling the truth. And if that is bothersome to people, then maybe they shouldn't be in the business. Don't you fear God, George? It's time for you to repent and turn to Jesus, George. The real God who died for your sins, George. You're not gonna find Jesus in there. I know they go to Dr. Taylor's church. They go to anybody's church. Anybody that either works for him or associates themselves with him over there, they go to the churches in their chopped up fetus trucks. And they put those trucks in front of the church. And there's all these little kids going with their parents and stuff. They have nothing to do with anything that he has anything to do with. And yet they protest out there. Now you tell me where they're coming off from, you know, really. We've got the pictures of his dirty work, little children that he's dismembered, and we display them on our big placard trucks, our big truth trucks. We drive them around his facility. We drive them around the neighborhoods. We drive them around the community. It makes us the object of scorn and reproach, but all we're doing is telling the truth over and over and over. To know Dr. Tiller is to know one of the most compassionate people I know. He is a very profound, uh, profoundly gentle man. I know that what he does, he in his mind, he probably thought that he was helping women. That's what he talks about. That's what so many people praise him for, is helping women. But I, I don't know that enough people have told him that it didn't help me. It really hurt me. My parents convinced me that an abortion was the only answer. At age 14, Kelly Dickerson was pressured by family to have an abortion at George Tiller's Wichita Clinic. I first learned of Kelly's story online around the same time a memorial for Tiller was happening in Vancouver, B.C. He was one of the few doctors known for doing uh, third trimester abortions where, for example, the fetus um, could not survive after birth, catastrophic conditions, or where the mother's life was in danger. I was five months pregnant and felt my baby move inside of me. Nothing was wrong with her, nothing was wrong with me. I was simply young at the time I got pregnant. And without a hesitation, he murdered my child. I assisted in it, but he murdered my child. No questions asked, just, oh, you're 14, where's the money, let's do this. Contrary to the, the shame and the stigma and the depressing myths around abortion care that that women have to endure and that actually alienate them from getting the support that they deserve. One of his mottos for his clinic service was, we make women's dreams come true. And you'd go into this separate you know, examination room and they'd insert 
these expandable sticks into your cervix to slowly dilate you over the five day process. Every time I was going in there and they were doing this, it was painful and I was thinking that, you know, this is wrong and I, I can not can I stop it now? What were those papers I signed? Did I sign it away already? Can I stop? But those were just thoughts. I never acted on those thoughts. And as I lay on an examination table about the fourth day into the process, I waited for you know them to come in with the, the sticks to like they had for the last four days. Um, and my baby started to kick more than she had ever before. Um, I had felt her move previously, but this was unlike any other time. I mean, she was doing somersaults and I kept thinking, what is wrong? Like, what are you doing down there? And somehow she must have known because George Tiller entered shortly after and inserted a long needle into my abdomen. Um, and after that, I never felt her move again. Oh my goodness, there's really a wire out there someplace that's not doing well. Well, I guess that means it's an uh, end of interview. The last interview Troy Newman did before Tiller closed. And I knew that then it was too late. All those thoughts that I had had about I should get up and I should run, it was over. I had no option to do that anymore because she was already dead. Sometimes I wonder how many people are missing from our lives. Family, friends, schoolmates, neighbors, co-workers, and fellow artists. We compromise the idea of the right to life. That's in our Constitution. Everybody has a right to life, but the courts today say, oh, we don't recognize them. Canada is one of only three countries in the world that have no legal restrictions against abortion. The other two countries are China and North Korea. It's actually a good thing because uh, we don't need any regulations governing pregnancy because that amounts to discrimination against women because only women get pregnant, not men. And um, it really affords women a freedom and a level of equality that uh, few other countries enjoy. In the absence of law, there is this sort of, sort of self-indulgent tyranny that can take over. And I think that's a very valid concern, you know, that because we don't have any law, then you can just do whatever, which is true. And in the abortion issue, you can do whatever. There's no law. You can, you can have an abortion at any stage, right up to, you know, the baby's just coming out and you decide you want to kill it. And that's legally, there's no law against that at this point. The existing law in 1988 was struck down, it was a poor law that allowed uh, abortion since 69. Uh, and in the Morgenthaler decision of 88, basically we have no law protecting the unborn here. Somebody says, well, it's just abortion. Canada's Supreme Court struck down the previous abortion law, saying it was unconstitutional. The decision came after a 20-year battle for free abortion on demand, launched by abortion advocate Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. He started doing illegal abortions in 1968 at his home clinic in Montreal, near where I was conceived. It, it is recognized by a majority of people that, yes, Dr. Morgenthaler is a Canadian hero um, to millions of Canadian women. Uh, he saved thousands of lives uh, over the last um, 30 years, and uh, Canadian society uh, owe him a great debt. It's uh, just alarming to see that we've gone from a country that used to prosecute uh, abortionists to, to one that uh, now honors uh, Henry Morgenthaler, who's Canada's probably worst mass murderer. And given, given, given the order of Canada, it's just, uh, just uh, sickening, really. For some, Henry Morgenthaler is a villain. For others, he's a hero. I interviewed him just before he was awarded an Honorary Doctor of Laws degree by the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Morgenthaler received the award at the age of 82 in 2005, the year he performed his last abortion. Well, I feel uh, flattered and uh, good about it because it is finally a recognition by a university in Canada, the first one, that. Uh, the work I've done over the years is worthwhile and uh, had an impact on Canada, Canadian women, Canadian life. So it's very gratifying for me. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and in the name of Senate, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa upon Dr. Henry Morgenthau. It started off as a as a humanitarian. Uh, gesture. I had uh, I had uh, presented the brief to the House of Commons 
uh, which debated changes in the abortion law in which I said in the name of three humanist organizations that women should have a right to ask for the abortion and get one, a safe one, by medical people rather than be exposed to the charlatans or uh, back alley butchers who were uh, <clears throat> providing help which often resulted in death or injury. For a long time, I'd harbored some real resentment against Dr. Morgenthaler. I thought, he's a professional. How come he couldn't recognize when I told him I didn't want to do this to my baby? There were times that I've heard him speak on television programs about that every child wants to be loved and that that has been a real focus and that's been something a drive behind his choice to perform abortions and and I understand having passion in your heart to pursue what you believe is right but what part of me saying I don't want to do this to my baby says that I don't want my baby I wish to thank the University of Western Ontario for honoring me today by conferring on me the title of Doctor of Laws. What really thrilled me about this um, award was the fact that it was being given out by basically a mainstream uh, university and um, it was a recognition, that really the first major recognition um, by a mainstream organization of his accomplishment. You know, it was clear that the vast majority of uh, Western, like the vast majority of people in Canada, support Morgan Taller, and it was just so great to see him finally getting the recognition he deserved. It was very moving. The award also stirred up a passionate response from those against abortion. Those of us who are gathered here are in solidarity with the unborn. Every time that uh, the choice that our opponents celebrate uh, is exercised, a human life ends. So we stand grieving in solidarity with those who have died. And on a personal level, I also stand in solidarity with my sister who uh, had an abortion some 30 years ago and nearly took her own life in grief. And there was none of these people around to help her when she was at that point. She found forgiveness in Jesus, not in, not in the likes of Henry Morgenthaler. They were long gone by that time. I also wish to congratulate the university and its president, Dr. Paul Davenport, for standing by its decision in spite of protests by people opposed to what I represent and stand for. The full rights of women to self-determination and reproductive freedom. Women's freedom isn't achieved on the corpses of aborted fetuses. Women's freedom is achieved on its own merits, not on that merit. Whatever you think of Henry Morgenthaler, good, bad, or misguided, he certainly leaves a lasting impression. We have a very strong majority in this country, about 80 percent according to a recent Gallup poll, which believes that it should be a woman's right to have an abortion on request, and it should be done under good conditions. Was the doctor right? Was the poll true? Do that many Canadians really support abortion on demand? I needed to see and hear from people myself. I conducted A Word on the Street, my own video poll, of 2,000 Canadians from Vancouver, BC to St. John's, Newfoundland. As a stay-at-home dad, I brought along my son and daughter, who were four and two at the time. We're close to our house now, yay! And David? Yeah, 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 yeah. We made it. Yep, we made it. You guys did great on this trip. Dad! That was, this has been a huge trip. Dad! Across Dad, Canada Dad, and back? Dad, yep. Dad, I can see my home! Yeah. 80% believe in a woman's right to abortion on request. That's what the doctor said. I want to hear from you, the people, instead. A word, a word on the street. Give your view so the poll will be complete. A word, a word on the street. Give your view so the poll will be complete. My, my best guess is there is no consensus. My, my best guess is there is no consensus. I'm going across the country, I'm doing a documentary film, and so I'm just asking people what their view is on the subject of abortion. I hate it. Abortion? I think it's right. 
I don't think it's right well, at all. Well, I think that everybody should have a choice. I myself, I say that not lightly. I had an abortion and I had, I have no regrets. No regrets. Je préférais que les femmes choisissent d'avoir le bébé, mais si elles peuvent vraiment, vraiment pas l'avoir, bien je crois qu'elles ont le droit de de disposer de leur corps puis de se faire avorter si pour eux c'est vraiment si avoir le bébé ça serait un, un problème dans leur vie qu'elles n'ont pas d'argent puis que l'enfant après ça serait malheureux bien myself I've had one so I'm kind of biased that's a pretty heavy topic for a sunny day don't you think it is yeah, man I think it's up to the girl really it's plain simple I mean there's no right or wrong it's all what you believe right they have enough uh, scientific evidence today with ultrasound and everything that they can actually see the whole baby and know at what stages of development it is. And if you ever did that to an animal, you'd be, you'd be charged. But they get away with it with human life. It's just so unreal. In my case, um, I wasn't working and I was in an abusive relationship and I'm bipolar and when you're pregnant you can't really go on the medication you should be on uh, if you're bipolar so in my case my doctor said it medically wasn't the best thing for me to have a baby oh that, that's a pickle of a conundrum i think abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women um, as the feminist uh, ellis paul mentioned uh, i think it's a failure on our part of society that women have to make this choice i think we should do everything we can to support them and otherwise women are getting hurt children are getting killed um, science is clear that the unborn are human beings from the moment of conception. Personally, I'm kind of biased against abortions. Um, just, I was nearly abortion, so I wouldn't be here today. But um, I still consider it ripping apart a live person. As a survivor of the genocide of Rwanda, um, I think that abortion is not a good thing because I learned to appreciate what is life. Moi, je suis d'accord avec l'avortement. Okay. Parce qu'il y a des jeunes mamans, là, comme de 14 ans, là, qui ont des bébés à 14 ans. <rire> J'en ai que t'es criminel, moi, je suis non. Ah. Non! <rire> non pour l'avortement, je suis contre ça! Non! Tu tues quelqu'un! It's not even worth putting a child in this world, because it's... It's not decent. It's, it's a shitty world. You don't hear much about the men's perspective or the male perspective afterwards. Uh, so even reading up on literature and things like that, when I was thinking maybe getting an abortion or, or not, uh, I never really stumbled upon that, so I didn't get to hear the voices of men regarding the issue. I guess I'm for it, you know what I mean? I think a woman has a right to choose, you know what I mean? I'm not Christian, so yeah, I'm, I'm for abortion. It's a woman's right to choose, you know what I mean? It's her body. I don't know how my, my wife feels about it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about abortions? I'm against it. Yeah, she's against it. Okay? There's more money in kids than there is new cars. It's great for the economic growth of the country. I got pregnant in October of last year with a partner that I've had for a while. He's now my husband. and. Um, him and I were both at the time in our third year of university and there would be no way that we could deal with or support the child, especially since I already have um, some, some stuff that's wrong with my reproductive organs, so I'm very sick and I wouldn't have been able to carry the child properly. So um, yeah, I had an abortion in December. I would have had the child sometime in July and I have no regrets, none at all. I don't agree with it really. I ended up just coming out of the hospital because I had a tubal pregnancy, so it doesn't really, it's not abortion, but there was nothing really else you could do. So that's why I had surgery done, but I don't agree with abortion at all. Not one bit. If the mother's life is in jeopardy, yes. But just because somebody goes out and gets pregnant, they want an abortion, no. I don't believe it. Everyone's different. There's different circumstances yeah. for different stuff. Like, should we color our hair? Should we not color our hair? Should we wear shorts? Should we not wear shorts? It's everybody's it's, opinion. I don't think it's that it's, simple of a choice. Mais tu sauf que dans un autre sens, si la fille est mal pris, qu'elle se retrouve avec un flot de sol, puis que l'enfant il va avoir une vie désastreuse, tout, 
c'est pas mieux non plus, sauf que tu choisis jamais la date puis l'heure de, de, de ton, horloge, ton horloge biologique. I don't know that I could do it, you know, myself. I think I might chicken out and just love the baby and go for it, but I don't think that the choice could ever legally, ethically be taken away from a woman to make that decision for herself. It is shocking that we talk so much about human rights and the, the right to life supersedes any other right. Why are we talking about rights, rights, rights? And the right to life is being denied to people who cannot defend themselves. I think they all have rights. Right here, there's a perfect prime example. I have two right here, and if, if you were to actually take this out of the human body, you wouldn't have that pretty smile or that tired eyes that she's got on right now. There's another one down there. Give them a chance. Somebody else can't have kids. We got blessed with a few. But I think that it's, uh, I think that it's, uh, would be a blessing to give somebody that can't have kids the opportunity to have one of these. I think it's wrong. Do not kill your babies. I want to know what it is. I'm asking people what their view is on abortion. What's that? Is it it's like wrong? What is it? It's when you it's kill, wrong. it's when you kill the babies inside you. Oh. They should at least let them live for a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in a hospital, so we used to get the little fetuses and sorry, frustrates me. <laughs> So that was after the abortions? Yeah. So, they're little people. They're little people. I'm entitled to have a completely different opinion, and we won't fight. I don't think abortion is good. I'm against it. <laughs> so, what I, I think it's killing. Yeah. What if a girl got raped? Well, you can still put it up for adoption. Right. What if you're going to get kicked out of your house? Because well, your parents will, will kill you if you got pregnant. Well, you could go with your friends. Like, there's other things you can do. So two different opinions. The rule should be that after a certain amount of time, let's say 24, 28 weeks, your abortion should not be granted on request. It should be a special case where uh, <clears throat> somebody has to decide that uh, this is too late for that. Have you had an abortion? No. You can still Did you, re you regret it, your child? You said keep abortion legal, so you regret it, your child. I've had four abortions, and I, I had to live 25 years of my life on drugs. It not, was not my choice. My mother took me on two of them. I was raped. Regardless of how she feels, abortion is should be a right um, of women. Reproductive freedom is so important to our equality, and it's so important to have a woman's right to choose because children shouldn't be brought into this world unless they can be loved and in a family that can take care of them. And not every woman that gets pregnant is able to do that. So it's an important thing. So regardless of what happens with... I'm having an interview here. That's really rude. Can you be quiet, please? Regardless of what happens with this or what the outcome is, it still wouldn't change my mind that um, abortion should be a right for every single woman in this country. Uh, Hi. Since he brought up uh, Norma McCorvey, um, I'm just wondering what, what is your response to her attempt to reverse Roe v. Wade? Um, the reporter, and by the way, a reporter from one of the Canadian broadcasts is here. Norma McCorvey was the plaintiff in Roe v. Wade. Norma McCorvey is better known as Jane Roe in the Roe v. Wade case that legalized abortion in the United States. In 2005, she filed a motion with the Supreme Court to overturn the 1973 judgment, but the court voted against hearing it. I was able to interview Norma in Washington the year she filed that motion. How many people know the woman at the center of Roe v. Wade never even had an abortion? It was really kind of funny about how it all happened because um, after I went to the illegal abortion clinic, and found the pitiful conditions that it was in. Uh, it had been raided a week before I went. This transit came by to, and he asked why I was there and I said, well, I came for them to take my baby. And he says, oh, th those people aren't here anymore. And then I started looking around uh, the illegal clinic and 
it, it suddenly dawned on me that I wasn't supposed to be there. So I, I left and went home and, and cried. The adoption attorney that I went to uh, was the one who put me in touch with Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of hard to plan. And I thought, what part of this do I not understand? Here I am trying to give a childless couple a child, and he's turning me over to two women who want to turn overturn the Texas statute on abortion. Didn't compute. So, in, in layman's terms, hippie terms, I thought that they just wanted to legalize abortion in the state of Texas. Little to my knowledge, they, they had a hidden agenda. I had very sporadic contact with them uh, after I signed the affidavit on, I believe it was March the 17th of 1970. And then Sarah, what years and years went by. Um, I obviously gave birth to my child and gave her up for adoption. And then uh, Sarah called me from DC and said, uh, I'm going to the Supreme Court to argue your case tomorrow. Do you want to go? And I said, uh uh. And I left the Supreme Court and said to people, what did I say? because I was so concentrating on the questions and how to answer them. And I knew it would be a very long time before the same issues would be presented again. I left not knowing if I'd won or lost and started waiting. When Roe versus Wade was handed down three years later, uh, I read about it in the newspaper just like everybody else did. I didn't get any particular consideration because I was a plaintiff. Eventually, on January 22, 1973, I'd just gotten elected to the Texas Legislature. I was over at the State Capitol. The phone rang, and it was a reporter from the New York Times. And the reporter said, does Miss Weddington have a comment today about Roe versus Wade? And my assistant, who answered the phone, said, should she? <laughs> <laughs> and the reporter said, it was decided today. And my assistant said, how was it decided? <laughs> and the words came back, she won it, seven to two. The right of privacy, founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. The right of privacy, founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty, is the brought right up to the compass found a woman's the decision whether or not a personal liberty whether or is the not. right of privacy whether to or not founded in the woman's decision whether or not a whether or not is brought up whether or not a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy justice harry blackman roe v wade 1973 i look back and think how much those words of the Supreme Court decision have meant that women could make the most important decisions for their lives. When the decision was handed down, it, it really kind of broke my heart because I thought, For the rest of my life, I'm going to have to live with knowing that I was the plaintiff and that it was my test case that has killed 45 million children.
The United States Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade was a radical departure from the traditional Western civilization understanding and belief in the sanctity of human life. In this case, the court said we can never know when human life actually begins, and then it went on to further say that when we know when human life begins, it must be meaningful before it can be legally protected. That is, there's a category of non-meaningful human life that need not be protected. This decision therefore opens the door for the concept of a human life not worthy to be lived and thus could be taken at the will of the people for any or no reason. That original decision that was written by seven crusty old men were written for men, by men, and make no mistake about it. I represent women and I see their suffering and, and they get blamed for this and we see what they go through. But this was for men, by men, in the name of women, blaming the women. And it's the men who want abortion, it's the men who created abortion, and it's the men who have lied that somehow this is a great right to women. It was a big lie. And then I was told that, oh, it'll make everything better. Well, during the procedure, they, uh, I felt like my guts were being ripped out. And it was very painful. So. That right there told me, wait a minute, that's a lie. This is very painful. I had no anesthesia. Didn't have anesthesia in the clinics then. And next to me was the jar that the baby was being sucked into. And I could see that it was not a blob of tissue. It was fingers and toes. And I freaked out right in the middle. You lied to me by a scream. And then they're holding me down. And the doctor's screaming, you get her under control. And, and the woman's down. you said this is what you wanted. Well, they didn't really give me much choices. I didn't have any choices. It's not what I wanted. It was out of desperation that I felt that was the only choice I had. It's interesting, on my way to the abortion clinic, it was, I can see it now, it was down uh, in Montreal by Park Avenue. There was a stoplight and I remember thinking, if I just get out of this car and run, <laughs> what part of that was choice? You'd think as lesbians, we would want to do what's best for women, and abortion is not what's best for women. Um, it's best for men. Abortion's easy for men. They pay the money, woman has the abortion. It's done and over with, they can walk away. This year, it's five, five years after the abortion. And it's, it's been, it's, sometimes I wake up and it's, it's still wonder, uh, about, you know, like, oh, I could have a five-year-old right now, or, or, you know, he or she would be going into kindergarten or first grade, and knowing that I, I was able, in some sense, to give it a life, give it a good life. I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in poverty. I could have definitely allowed it to flourish. I, you know, I didn't have much money, but I could definitely have given it life. And it's not just a matter of the men not accepting their responsibility because they are a father and they urge and coerce and demand an abortion, which is all true. Or they just withdraw from the situation and they won't discharge their obligation as father. It's not just that. It's that they're the ones who rely on the availability of, of abortion when they exploit the women in the first place. Everything about men is based on sight. Women are based on heart. But men, the whole media, the whole advertising world, everything about our media is geared towards men and what they see. And I want to tell you, as somebody who is in bondage to the idolatry of vision, we need to repent right now to our sisters. Looking for a mate, and you want to make a date with the girl that's never late. We're always at your service, large and small ones, every size. Some are dumb and some are wise. We don't have to advertise that we're always at your service. How many empty hearted daughters are there because men have never been taught how to treat women, how to value them? And the only time they really begin to do that is when they want something sexually from them. And I think we've raised a whole generation of men who have a
kind of a spirit or cultural cultural of entitlement in their spirit. It's really a tragedy. You're probably wondering how this liberal lesbian has gotten me into high, into help you know, into the debate. Well, when I was young, um, I came from a family of eight kids and uh, quite a dysfunctional mess. And uh, my dad was. Um, we didn't talk things about sex and birth control and stuff like that. That was not uh, something that was discussed. The only thing I heard on a regular basis, my dad would get in these drunken tirades and uh, he would always say, if you ever come home pregnant, you cannot come home. The combination, I think now, of the early sexual abuse and the fact of not having my dad at home at some real crucial times in my life led me to a period between about 15 and 21 that I soon learned where I could get attention and that was sexually. So you call it sexually acting out, but I guess you call it promiscuous, but all those words are just words. What to me they are is the fruit on the tree of what happens when somebody has been bruised and burdened and battered down and doesn't have a chance to share their story. I was raped at the age of 13. My virginity was stolen from me. And when I had that abortion wide awake in that clinic, I felt like I was being defiled again. And I felt like I was being raped again. And I remember when the Lord spoke to me and just he said, the only difference between the women that have gone to an abortion clinic and the ones that haven't is uh, the ones that have gone had gotten pregnant. I've actually had two abortions. Um, both times, obviously, it was an accident, and the second time came after, very shortly after the first time, thinking, oh, it wouldn't happen again. Never, never thought it would happen to me, she said. It happened twice. At the time, not aware of much numb doubt. Until the afterburn She'd surrender to a tender touch Oh boy, she learned too much See her, feel her Reeling from the feeling I never regretted my decision. I felt like that I was doing the right thing and that I wanted to be ready and bring a child into the world when it was best for both both people and at that time it really wasn't for me and I wasn't with somebody that was going to be able to, to to support me and to support raising a child so that gets lost in the debate why are women having abortions um, is it lack of money lack of resources um, Ellen Gut no Gutmeier Gutmacher <laughs> I never can say that name um, came out with um, Thing that most women abort because of lack of emotional and financial resources. Why aren't we changing that? Yeah, but the long-term effects were what were really hard. Noelle wrote, after an abortion at 19, the guilt was unbearable. My self-esteem was shattered and I was an emotional mess. I went into depression, couldn't stop crying and had to quit my job. I had severe nightmares, was self-destructive and found myself in abusive relationships. A baby will never hurt you, but an abortion will. Janelle wrote, I thought it would solve my problem, but abortion made me feel guilty. I felt worthless. I hated myself. I couldn't sleep. I was full of anxiety and anger. I got depressed and I had to go on medication because I aborted my child. Children should have a right to live there, human beings too. See, I'm from Winnipeg, right? I tried to pretend it didn't happen and justified in my mind for 10 years. I was only 14 and my parents pressured me into it. I did experience anger towards them, low self-esteem and depression after the abortion. I've had a lump removed from my breast and worry about the breast cancer link too. She's from Winnipeg. Lori from Saskatchewan wrote, I was pressured by my, my boyfriend and parents to abort, but I got severe depression after the abortion and thought of committing suicide several times over the, the next 16 years. 
not a day went by that I didn't think of that abortion and my dead baby. So there's just so much pain that women suffer because these are our children that we're killing. And you don't realize it at the time. And then one day it hits you and, and you can never take it back. And so, you know, we live with that guilt and we live with that pain. You have the abortion, you're still in the same position. You don't have your financial resources and you still don't have the emotional support. It's still that way after the abortion. So then you have a wounded woman, a dead baby, and the same circumstances that you had to begin with. And um, nothing has been learned. Nothing has been changed. To every woman gathered here, I repent for imagining you in the wrong way. I repent for allowing pornography and the internet to become the idols of our world like Baal, Ashtaroth, and Molech. I repent for allowing women to be objectified through imagery like Playboy, Penthouse, Players, all that garbage that's out there that leads men into bondage and has them abuse women. See, women are carrying scars that they weren't designed, and burdens they weren't designed to carry in silence alone. And every man needs to cry out to the women. See, one woman I was involved with for three years, she had at least three abortions that I know of. And one day she called me and she said, I have breast cancer. And then after two operations, she said, I have to have it removed. And, and the tamoxifen that she had that she was gonna take was gonna take her wound. So when I asked every man to come just find a woman to repent to, it doesn't have to be the woman you hurt. We need to cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God holds every man accountable. He said, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. I just believe that father, that father connection for women is, is critical. And I believe we need to provide that. It's, it's one of the answers and it's the call to true manhood and authentic manhood in our culture. When we see that, we'll never see woman as a sexual object again. When we see her as a broken daughter who did not give her many hugs from her dad, when we see those skimpily, those ladies are not clothed with very much clothing and operating in seduction, it's out of brokenness. It's, it really is because their fathers never really gave them very many hugs. And when a man gets that, he'll never see a daughter like that again the same way. And all the other things that go on in our culture are going on with all the women in our lives. All our mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters are being objectified and sexualized and depersonalized and uh, really dehumanized by this sexual objectification. To my knowledge, all men on some level, in some degree, at some time in his life is guilty of that. The second probably greatest revelation men need is the revelation of the demonic hatred for women in our culture and, the, and how that manifests itself. And we really see it in every culture of the earth. We see a an oppressive, uh, I really believe, demonically birthed uh, hatred for women. And uh, when men see that and they understand what is being loosed against women, the kind of messages being loosed against them, the depersonalization, the devaluation, uh, the kind of conflict it creates in them, and really the mandate that God had, had given them all along to be to create an atmosphere of safety and security and and create an atmosphere in which women can be uh, valued as persons. And it doesn't matter what we did 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or yesterday. Today's the day that we have to resolve that we're going to become, maybe for some of us, for the first time, real men. And we are going to pledge, starting with each one of us, never, ever again to act towards a woman in any way other than out of respect, love and commitment. On behalf of every man that's ever hurt you, will you please forgive me? Because I'm guilty of the sins of the fathers being passed down to the third and fourth generations. See, my great-grandfather, he raped my great-grandmother when she was his slave. And my grandfather was born from that. And into that was raped into me, the oppression of women through the bondage of men being in bondage to their flesh. Will you please forgive me?
during my tenure at Commonwealth Women's Clinic, I was responsible for the deaths of 10,000 babies. And it is 10,000 babies that I will answer for. Years ago, a former abortionist told me Joan Appleton was drawing pictures of babies and naming each one to represent the 10,000 abortions she'd assisted on when she was a clinic nurse. I sought out and met Joan in 1998. She was volunteering in a Right to Life office in St. Paul, Minnesota. When I told her some of my story and how I'd heard of hers, she looked at me as if she was seeing a ghost. I got a chance to hear Joan speak at a conference in Ireland almost a decade later. In order for me to participate, in order for anyone to, to take the life of another human being, you must dehumanize that person. Hitler could not kill the Jews without first dehumanizing. The Nazis loved this stuff. They, they practiced it, they were immersed in it. And some people believe that the reason why America is the way it is goes back to Operation Paperclip after World War II when we took in about 3,000 or more Nazi scientists, Nazi intelligence officers, doctors, the whole deal. We took these guys in. And some of these guys were, not all of them, but some of them were occult adepts. And they brought the darkness. And isn't it interesting that before, before that happened, uh, abortion was considered by most people in this country to be something to shun and was abhorrent. And now it's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm pregnant, boom, I'll get an abortion. It's insane how far we've gone. A lot of people really uh, don't know that Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist and she had connections uh, with the Nazis in Europe. She is the founder of Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of abortion and her agenda was to purify the race by getting rid of the poor, the Native Americans, the blacks, the Hispanic. See, I'm, I'm, my folks were from Mexico. Margaret Sanger saw poor people, black people, disabled people as what she called social weeds and, uh, you know, thought that these are people that um, should really be eliminated or prevented from propagating their seed. Eugenics was a philosophy endorsed by the Nazi regime in Germany and it seeks to improve humankind through controlled and selective breeding of human beings. Now Sanger sought to develop superior human beings whom she believed should control the impure masses. So it seems as though if you follow the trends and, and make observation, it seems as though you know these clinics are planted conveniently in places that make it easy uh, for people of minority um, races to have access to it. If you look at what's happened in the black community, it's, you can almost say Margaret Sanger was successful in carrying out um, her, her, her wishes. Some anti-abortionists um, say that abortion is the present-day Holocaust. So you, especially being a Jewish person, what is your response to it? I think this is an obscene comparison because then it's it's very wounding to me personally who has survived the Nazi German Holocaust. Uh, it's very unfortunate and irresponsible to make comparisons like that. Whoa, whoa, hey! Get back! Get back! Get back. Get back. We need to learn from history. Current trends, if continued, means that Western culture will move down a slippery slope that ends in the acceptance of the death camps of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. That's where once great German nation ended up when it accepted these types of trends. No, I was 16 when, yeah, when I was uh, put in a ghetto in my city lodge in Poland. The Germans arrived, they decided to um, create a ghetto where the Jews were herded in and surrounded by barbed wire enclosures and uh, then eventually later on they decided on the on the final solution which was to kill every living Jew, uh, man, woman or child. Hey! We're people! What's wrong with you? All men are created equal. That comes from Judeo-Christian biblical thought. That's where it comes from. And it sets up people as being equal. No matter what your color, race, creed, or anything else, we are equally created in the eyes of God. The moment we move away from that, and we're not somehow equally created in the eyes of God, then the state will tell us who lives, who dies. And we see that 
with the former Soviet Republic uh, of, of Russia, where 65 to 75 million people perished in the gulags, 3 million under Pol Pot, another 60 to 70 million in China. I mean, the list is endless. The moment a society takes God out of the equation, then they're replacing it with what? And it's the state. And now the state will legislate. You don't break out of prison when you think you're free. You don't listen to reason led by insanity. Trans, 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 transformation of a nation. Control the information. Divide and conquer works like a charm. Who needs enemies when we do ourselves harm? Problem created, reaction desired, demanded solution, agenda conspired. We must fight to regain our freedom, or everything is lost. Everything! Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. And so it is through that dehumanization, over a period of time, we dehumanize the baby, we dehumanize the mother, and we dehumanize ourselves. We use a lot of medical terminology to try to dehumanize what's happening here. We, we call this a fetus or an embryo. Well, those basically are Greek or Latin words for baby. Uh, we talk about uh, products of conception uh, instead of a baby. We're trying to hide, disguise what, what is being destroyed when we do abortions. There's humanity that's being destroyed. So you, 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 you alter the vision of what you see. Uh, for example, rather than seeing hands, little hands and toes and, and uh, bony structures in an abortion, you see fetal tissue or products of conception. When I woke up from that abortion, I had been involved in witchcraft and Satanism in, in San Francisco, and I had one of my friends who was sitting beside the bed who was also involved in that with me. And I looked at her and I said, Daphne, I just killed my baby. And she said, no, no, that wasn't what it was. You weren't supposed to, don't think of it like that. It's now all about, um, you know, what's human? You know, who's human and who's not? So we're actually taking some steps backward uh, in, in redefining, you know, humanity. You know, when is it really a child? You don't deal with a formed life yet. You don't deal with a person that you, you take that life from that person away. The woman, what she wants is basically, she wants to stop the development, the fetal development of an embryo, which is not yet a person, not yet a baby. To me in my heart now, they are so much babies. It's almost like there was a veil that was over my concept of what a pregnancy was, that was clouded by pain, that I couldn't see for me that it was a baby. But yet some way in my story, I'm telling you, I've said that word before, I don't want to do this to my baby. I wish somebody had asked me what, what would it would have meant for parenting. So somewhere in that I knew that it was a baby, but you almost have to turn that off to really go through an experience of terminating another life. The moment of conception is the moment of life, and that has to be sanctified. That has to be something that we look at and we value as a culture, of course, we don't. So by sacrificing um, these unborn chil uh, children, whether it's you know what people call a fetus or an embryo, or I, I just, you know, a zygote or whatever term you want to use, we are, we are creating a Luciferian, a satanic offering similar to what happened in the ancient world thousands of years ago. The only difference is instead of a high priest in some temple, we've got medical facilities with polished linoleum floors and doctors with white coats and stethoscopes on, you know, and smiling nurses. You know, we, we have to ask ourselves, are we out to produce a new human breed that is superior in intellect and physical prowess and in intelligence and this elite is protected in the law and in control of the masses and in control of those who aren't seen as superior, who aren't seen as valuable. All these things are possible when we accept the idea that there's such a thing as a human life not worthy to be lived and there's such a thing as a human being that is not a person protected under law. But there's a spiritual blindness that is taking place and I think that that's what often isn't recognized, that there is spiritual warfare involved, there is a, an enemy that humankind has and it is a demonic enemy 
that is capable of blinding people to right or wrong. And I think that's what's operating in abortion. If you don't want to be arrested, now is the time to leave. If you stay, you will be arrested and you will be removed. The shedding of innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood. No babies are innocent. You were in your mother's blood. I was in my mother's blood. I had three abortions. I was five. The debate about whether abortion should be a criminal act is over. If people want to debate other things, you know, in terms of issues around how women feel about abortion or, you know, grieving about abortions or all that, I'm fine with it. The debate is over. It doesn't do any good for women to open the debate again. It's just, you know, these religious fanatics who won't let go. You know, Stephen Woodward, Stephen Harper, and Bill M312 are reminders to us that rights are never guaranteed. We all wish they were when we fought for them so hard, but they are not guaranteed. Well, we know this motion is about uh, not just trying to uh, look at the question of whether fetuses have, uh, you know, are human beings and whether they should be included in the definition of human beings. It's about giving a person to fetuses, and uh, which would take away women's rights, basically. So that's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of women's rights being removed, and we can't understand why in the 21st century, in this modern Western democracy, we're still debating whether women should have human rights. The fight's not over. We can never give up the fight for our rights. That body inside your body belongs to somebody else. So we should just disregard our own bodies? The public debate over Federal Bill M312 stirred up a kind of motion sickness inside of me. I cared too much. It was personal. Motion 312 brought me back to that day in South Africa when I blacked out during a dance drama to a song about abortion, something I knew nothing about back then. My mother helped me see I was connecting with the rejection my spirit had felt from the very beginning inside her womb. Maybe that connection explains how I knew my firstborn son was there at conception. In the poetic story, His Name is David, which I wrote for my son, I describe where he was at from conception through birth. In the book, where I'm trying to convince my wife she's pregnant, I say there's a spirit in a body inside of you. From my experience, I know we are more than just physical beings. We are spirit and have an awareness from the very beginning. United, the people will never be defeated. What if the debate over abortion is being used to divide us politically, spiritually, and relationally? What would happen if we were united in recognizing the value and dignity of every human being from conception to natural death? And I realize some of you out there that, that listen to this you know, that are, that are on the other side of the aisle, that are, that are pro-choice, you know, a woman's right to choose and all this. And look, it's a very complex issue, but I will say this, that when we, when we strip it away from all the different sides and, you know, women's right, this right, that right, there's life there. And that life, if we don't sanctify it, if we don't look at it as something special, we are on a slippery slope and as a culture. When I actually look at our generation, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that one of the number one things we've had to contend against is the spirit of death. And one of the ways it's manifested is through abortion. Um, another one of the ways that it's manifested in is, is through a death culture and actually a, a whole part of our generation that is all about glorifying death. Brain. If you think about it in these terms that in Canada today, once every five minutes at least, I think the, the stats are even more than that, but let's just say once every five minutes, a baby is murdered by his or her own mother and father, right? The highest form of sacrifice, a mockery of the cross. And, and in this act, there is actually a demonic empowerment that happens to, you know, I'll call it the spirit of abortion. You see, there's a spirit a spirit of death that brings fear and that was attached to me since my abortion in 1973 and it plagued me no matter what I did it was the curse every curse of the law that's written in this book and it entrapped me so that I couldn't turn there was not, nowhere to go above and nowhere to go below because I was bound to a spirit of death 
I did 23 abortions. And the 23rd one is the one that changed my mind about abortion. There's no real human being that you see in a first trimester abortion uh, because of the process is destructive. Well, this 23rd abortion was done at a time before ultrasound was available. And the patient was a little bit overweight, so I misjudged the size of this pregnancy. Instead, she was a little bit further along, as I was to find out. Initially, the abortion started as normal. I put the suction curette in, the water broke, and nothing further came out. This had never happened before. I pulled out the suction curette, and I could see the leg of a baby plugging it up. And I realized that this is a larger baby than what I thought. This is 14 or 15 weeks. And so I had to change techniques. I had to uh, get a pair of ring forceps out and grab inside the womb and pull out the other leg. And then as I pulled out the chest and the abdomen of the baby, it had ripped open and inside was a tiny beating heart. And I looked at that and just turned to the scrub nurse and said, I'm sorry. I mean, in my heart, I knew it was wrong at that point. Nobody told me it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. This was murder. This was a baby. And then I had to find the head of the baby and I could see the face of the baby that I just killed. And I knew I couldn't do abortions anymore after that. So the healing process must be to return the humanity to the unborn child, return the humanity to the woman, and return humanity to ourselves. I traveled all the way to Ireland in 2006 just to hear Joan share her story firsthand. This was the last time she would share it. Though she courageously first spoke publicly in 1993, we have to ask why her story and many others like hers are not more widely known. We all have something to learn from others, even those who hold a view that is opposed to ours. Choosing to make this documentary was a defining moment in my life which ignited a trial-by-fire refining of my character and relationships. It's taken nine years, and if not for my wife's love and support for me as a person and an artist, this work would never have been birthed. My hope is that women hurt by men and abortion will find solace and healing along their path to wholeness, and that men will choose to see and treat all the women in their lives with dignity and respect. When that happens, the debate over abortion will end. There is much truth out there that we must seek for ourselves with our mind, eyes, and heart open. Here now as a lover and a fighter too. Not to win, not to be right, but listen like friends do. It's time for the healing. Don't judge me, I won't judge you. Forgiveness rings true. Hope will see us through. Let love make things new. I have a dream. I have a dream that will come true. When you learn from me and I learn from you. Open, say, uh-huh, uh-huh, for my mind. Open, say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Your eyes open, say uh-huh, uh-huh Your heart, play, play Your part, mind, eyes, heart